we're currently using Diablo malt, uh, and we'll shortly be using a uh, malt from the state. I'm not sure if it's Diablo or Laureate. Uh, but we'll be getting that in shortly, and it'll pro possibly be this week. Yeah. And then, same again, we'll get some casks, uh, fast scope casks, and we'll fill that again. So we'll just continue and do this. Uh, so that's as close to single estate as we can get at this yeah, stage. Yeah, we're, we're, um, we're actually looking now to, to see if we can uh, culture yeast from, uh, from the area as well. I think that's something they're, they're looking into so that we can pretty much say everything is from three miles, within three miles of the actual distillery. Incredible to have that. So, so you're looking more like for flavour profile? Well... Malt, not yield or...? I th not... Yeah, the, the, the yield. Sometimes hill, hill ground will give you slightly different flavour into your malt because mm -hmm. it's, it's, it's harder ground. In here it's quite, a, it's quite a hard area for malt to grow so you get kind of different kind of, I would say, earthy notes from the malt. Uh, as opposed to kind of lower land, easier growing malt. So it picks up more flavour. It might not be quite as good yield, but it'll, it'll produce more flavour to the, the actual uh, spirit itself. Greg, Greg's left this stave out just to give, give you an, an idea of the, I guess, the different opportunity when it comes to toasting and treating the wood. So when you look down here, this is where you find big chocolatey coffee, really that kind of burnt oak, lots of tannin down here. And as you come into the middle, it becomes more like patisserie sugars, that kind of cinnamon, ginger, baked bread. And then when you come down to the side, when it's almost not been treated at all, you get lots of kind of green fruit um, and lots of more kind of, uh, yeah, like the fresh tropical fruit there as well. So I think one of the things we've looked at so far is that balance between uh, uh, well, Greg would describe it as nature and nurture, you know, because we want to taste the sort of natural um, qualities of the the, the, the product, the um, the Oak. ingredients we have, but it's also about controlling them in harmony with the the house style here at Fetter Cairn. So, using Scottish oak is a really interesting one because first and foremost, it has to taste like a Fetter Cairn whisky, but then at the, at the other end, it's really important that we actually taste the the impact of Scottish oak. So, hopefully, with the 18 year old, you got kind of a bit of both of those things there. I think this barrel is um, a Japanese oak actually. Yeah. Medium toasted Japanese oak cask, so playing around with lots of bits and pieces. Some of these casks are getting, in, uh, they'll be recasking as well. Right. So, uh, you know, we get the, the finish of uh, a Japanese oak. We've done that with different things. Uh, I don't know if you've seen earlier, we might have had the, the Warehouse 14. Uh, we've done a beer finish on that. Uh, so we work with our two local breweries, uh, Burnside and Six Degree North, and we exchange casks <coughs> with them. They finish their beer, we finish some of the whiskey in them, and they've had really, really good results. And hopefully later on yeah. today, we'll, we'll show you some of that and see what you think. Yeah, they make some amazing beer. The yeah. first time I came in here, actually, there was a whole um, number of barrels, and they just it said on chalk, darkness within. And I was like, wow, it's pretty cryptic. That was the name of the beer, of course. Yeah. <laughs> darkness within, I yeah. liked it. <laughs> But yeah, it's, it's, it's some really interesting flavours we're getting yeah. from various different uh, beers that were produced. So it's quite boutique, so I think, you know, s you yeah. know small amounts of stuff. But uh, to, to put that into, uh, you know, 12 year old or whatever, it's really interesting. Yeah. So you can have a little look at the, at the stave. Um, it doesn't, doesn't give much away, to be honest. But uh, if you want to turn your nose a little bit black, then. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> that's yeah. Um, but yeah. Bruce is going to take us into the distillery now. Yeah. So we'll, uh, so we'll, we'll just go through. There's a bit at the top of the stairs. There's some emergency stop buttons. Please don't press them. <laughs> <laughs> just walk up the stairs and we'll go into the still house itself. Okay? Okay. Great. Just follow me. What kind of bottle do you use? So the mash tun here is actually quite a rare mash tun. It's only one of three. Victorian era mash tuns left in production today, so uh, quite rare, but um, it's been replaced in the summer, is that right Bruce? Hopefully. Hopefully, yeah, so she doesn't have much long to go before her retirement. Um, but as Bruce says, we're mashing 24 times a week, and we'll use um, five tons of grist into the mash tun, and then our three waters. So our first water is 18,000 litres and that will go in at a temperature of 67 degrees Celsius and then we'll mash that, run it through the heat exchanger to cool it back down to 20 degrees Celsius 
Then our second um, water, 10,000 litres, that'll go in the top through a sprinkler system. We'll mash that. The temperature of the water this time will be 74 degrees Celsius. Again, we'll run that through and put that through our heat exchanger, ready to go for fermentation. The, the third water, uh, it'll be another 17,000 litres. This time we'll increase the temperature up to 84 degrees Celsius. Um, but this time there's not that many um, sugars left. So we'll hold that back and that will become our first water on the next mash. Okay. We're getting approximately, is it 412 litres of spirit? Yeah, around a bit like, yep. Per tonne of barley at the moment. Oh, good beat. So that's our yield. What will happen to this one after it's decommissioned? Do we know if it's going anywhere else? Uh, I don't think so. I think it's past its sell by date. Uh, but the, the new marsh tun that we're getting in will be of very similar nature. So we don't want to change too many things. We want to keep it as, as original as we possibly can uh, to give us the same kind of wort as we're getting from this marsh tun. The original one came from Glen Newgate, which was up in Peterhead, and it uh, closed in the 1950s, I think, the marsh tun came to better care and something else I read was that the second spirit safe also came with the with the mash one to better care so everyone likes to share equipment right yeah, <laughs> yeah. but I think uh, who is it that's making the new one hey, the Forsyth. Forsyth, yeah. yeah so they'll make a new tumble rate mash ton hopefully that will replicate the one that we have in production now yeah and will we make because this is cast iron isn't it will it be cast yes. iron as well I don't, don't think so no. okay just I thought I'd ask on you. It would be stainless then, wouldn't it? Yeah. 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 Okay, so we're going to go up and do, talk about fermentation now. So we'll go up the stairs behind you. Please mind your head. Again, there's a step up into the tun room and oh. the door is quite low. So, oh, um, somebody follow up. Kelly's going Okay, so welcome to our tun room at Fetter Care, and we might be biased, but we believe that we've got the most beautiful tun room in the whole industry, um, with the, the views and it's um, the smells. For me, this is where I can first smell bananas when I walk in here. Um, sometimes it's uh, more ripe and mashed, and sometimes it's just banana, but for me, it's always banana. I don't know about you guys. Um, but yeah, so our process of fermentation will bring our warts um, through into one of our wash backs. They hold in 25,000 litres of uh, warts and then we'll add 90 litres of liquid yeast and the magic will happen, the science will take over. And our fermentation time here is approximately 56 hours. Is that correct? Yeah. Yeah, 56 yeah. hours. Yeah. And then we'll have um, our wash, which will be 8% alcohol by volume after fermentation. Um, some of our washbacks are made from Oregon pine and some of our washbacks are made from Douglas fir. And again, in the summer, number one washback, um, it's time for it to retire, so it will also be replaced in the summer. But you're keeping the wood, so no, no steel? No, steel no. no, no. We just got a new uh, wash, wash box last, last year. Mm -hmm. It was last year. And uh, we're, we're due to get another one, it'll be the same. Mm -hmm. okay. We don't want to change anything. Then. Okay. Yeah. It's good. It's amazing, uh, some, some old photographs of when this building was sort of expanded um, in 2015 or 16. And it used to be two rooms. You can see there's a kind of uh, divide sort of halfway down where the room would split in two. There's stories of the guys, you know, even when the building had no roof, still uh, still continuing with work. Yeah. Through the day, through the night. Howling Gale kept production going. But as you can see now, it's a beautiful space to work in, you know, you've got the view. This is our cooling water source as well, actually, which is obviously very important. You've already seen the spirit stills. So all this natural spring water comes off the, the hills at ambient temperature and cools down the copper. So the colder it is outside, the better it is for whiskey making. Yeah. Maybe not the best for visiting when we're outside when it's really yeah. cold, but it's good whiskey making weather. So. Today we're making exceptionally good whiskey. <laughs> <laughs> experiment with different yeasts, are you planning to uh, ferment any longer than 56 hours? Or like going it, it, will it will depend on the yeast, to be, okay. to be honest with you. We're going to have to just uh, go with what, what, you know, what we get from it. Uh, we, we know we're not going to have the yields that we had before, but there will probably be 
better, well, different flavours from it. Uh, but we don't know. We have to. We have to. I, I would imagine that it will be uh, not altogether our yeast. It might go along with it, but it will have the the flavour profile from this area. So that's a project I think's been worked on by Harriet Watts. Yes, in, that's in, right. In Edinburgh, so the students there yeah. do a lot of work with such trials. There are spirit trials that they've already done with our. Yeah, yeast, I've sure. tasted some of them and they're yeah. they're interesting. So yeah, like from the from the new mix spirit, it's definitely different. A, a, a lot of, a lot of difference. I don't know how it will mature in the casks, but obviously there'll be a, a different flavour. So it'll yeah. be interesting. And it's just something special from just from this area. I think that's really really good. Especially if we're going to put it in our Scottish virgin Scottish oak, it's going to be pretty good. So something different. Of course, you know, as, as soon as we start a tour here, and Claire and Kelly will agree. We try and talk about the mash tun, but everyone's looking this way at the spirit stills. And as you just said there, it's it's almost quite hypnotic, you know, and it's it really is a mesmerising thing to look at. Um, this, these, these cooling rings, this was invented in, 19, uh, in the 1950s here at Fetter Cairn when there was only two stills. There was one wash still and one spirit still. And the distillery manager was called Alistair Menzies. And actually, in the recent years, there have been so many little articles that we found about things that he was trying to do here, like supersonic aging whiskey overnight and things like that. So he's obviously a very like experimental kind of guy. But every distillery also had an engineer. And there was an engineer here called John Twig and the two of them combined to create this innovative way to freshen up, to lighten the style of spirit that was being made here. And there's a few ideas of how this was invented, but one of the things I heard was that in the summer months in Scotland, when we had a much more consistent hot summer, we would wrap the casks in hose pipes outside with perforated holes, turn the water on to keep the casks damp so that they didn't dry out in the warm air. So maybe this was the idea that they had this hose pipe with perforated holes in it and he thought, well, I wonder what would happen if we did that to the spirit stills. So soaking the stills with cold water meant that obviously inside it was harder for, for the, the spirit to rise for collection. So today, if you hit this with a heat gun, what you'll notice is that up at the top of the still here, we have a temperature of about 30 degrees where the cooling ring hits the still and then towards the bottom it develops to about 80 degrees. So it's having a significant impact on the temperature within the stills. So I really kind of, ingenious way of trying to change the character of spirit that was being made here and the thing that I think is really interesting is that if it didn't work you could just take it off and it would be fine you you haven't you haven't changed everything about the distillery so a really kind of um, cost-effective way of creating a different style of spirit and of course you know today you'll see a number of different distilleries that are all different shapes sizes that contribute different layers of flavor but here we have this very visual thing that you can see which is having a direct impact on the flavour of what's in our glass. Another interesting thing is that we're not here to make this taste perfect because whiskey needs a number of years to mature in oak but having you know a really nice fruity DNA to start with is a, is a great place to be so um, we talk about the tropical fruit Claire mentioned already that you know you start to smell bananas and all those lovely fermenting flavours in, in, in the tun room but really this is where we control what we, what, we, what we capture. And for me this is where you find pineapple, banana, a little bit of dried mango in there. And then also today it's almost like quite popcorn-y. So you do get the cereal note, you get the malty character from the barley. But very, very fruit forward. And as it sits in the glass, even, even after 5-10 minutes it starts to change. And all those kind of popcorn-y, bready, malty flavours start to really come, come through. Is this... Um, Cut to 63 or is this? 68.6. 68.6? Yeah. Okay. Mm. Good stuff. So that, does this process harm the pot still a little bit more so you have to make changes quite often to, so you have to change the stills or? No. Or uh, 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 Something's like wrong. What's your, I didn't hear you. So, like, obviously, cooling down the copper would it have an impact on the thickness of the copper? So you have to change it more often. No, or? I would think it would be the opposite. It will prevent the, 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 the wear on the copper. Oh, okay. Yeah. So the, the the wash stills one and two will change these more often than spirit stills because wash stills you can drive hotter. Um, so this is really new, isn't it? That's only yeah. been in. Yeah. They're, they're all fairly new, new, new stills. Yeah. But uh, yeah, 
this one here is there's bits and pieces to be changed uh, but yeah. yeah they're fairly fairly new stills are good stills and well. then it was in the 1960s that the second side was was added as well so basically replicating the the copper cooling ring from spirit still one onto spirit still number two this is the, the, the vortex action within this as well, this is what you're getting, your lighter notes coming through there, right. so not your heavier notes coming up on the outside, that kind of keeps them down, so you get the lighter notes coming up, and that's what that's what it was really, I think, the only for is to kind of help the, the whiskey. That kind of vortex in the yeah. middle. I wonder if there's a way of, like, capturing that. You, you can't, like, if, if they turned off the heads, you can you can notice a difference. Yeah. So, so it does work. Yeah. You know, it genuinely does work. Yeah. How many litres of cold water go, go through this system? Uh, I've never measured it, to be honest. <laughs> <laughs> but the water, you can see the water gets collected here as well. And actually, you can see it from the back window. It gets sent back out. The thing, the thing with the water here is we, we, don't, we would be using this water anyway. So this water comes through, it goes down, and it goes back into the boiler. Yeah. So the boiler, it's, it's used for, for water before it goes into the boiler. It warms the water up. So we would be using the water anyway. Yeah. It's not just one job, if you understand. Yeah. But it's not just going down the drain either. Yes. Yeah, yeah. As you'll probably know, um, we don't really have managed forests in Scotland to purpose grow trees for Scotch whiskey. Most of our trees get battered by the wind and the rain. They're full of twists and turns and knots, so they're not ideal for making whiskey casks. But there is, if you're able to, um, if you're able to kind of build up the relationships necessary, there is an ability to use much more Scottish oak for the world of whiskey. But part of this whole journey is managing how much we actually use. Because if it was all to be zapped up by the world of whiskey, then the furniture makers would be very angry, as would a lot of other people as well. So. A lot of the wood um, that has lots of interesting twists and turns and knots will be sold by the, the, uh, by the sawmill here to furniture makers um, in Scotland and further afield as well. But it's really the boring bits that we want, right? It's the really straight bits and that's the bits that we'll take um, in all shapes and sizes. So smaller bits can be used for cask ends, anything that's long enough can be used for, for proper staves. And then all the offcuts can be used for a number of different uh, a number of different things. So, for example, the bark from Scottish oak trees. We work with a, a guy here on the estate who tans leather with the bark. So there's a whole number of different things we can use with the offcuts of Scottish oak as well. So literally nothing goes to waste. And um, for the 18 year old that we tried earlier on, we worked with three different forests uh, around the Highlands of Scotland. So Rossshire, Stirlingshire, and Perth Perthshire. But as you can see, there's a whole heap of access to, to oak from this estate itself as well. And later on today, we're going to try uh, as close to uh, something that's single estate as we have, um, which has only just turned one year old. Um, but obviously, when we get uh, oak from the estate, it's important that we use the local sawmill. So the guys here uh, quarter cut the, the oak for us. I'm going to just show you a, one of the pieces of uh, oak that we have just now. Quarter cut the oak, and then it's left to air dry. So you'll see all different types of wood types uh, air drying inside and outside of this building here and then just to make sure we get the moisture content down to the right um, amount for turning into barrels to actually manipulate just behind this building here there's an old milk truck and inside there there's actually a kiln and this is where they'll use uh, the last few weeks just to get the remaining moisture content out of the wood before we turn it into barrels. So most of it's air drying, takes about four years. And then finally, we'll just put it, pop it in a kiln just to remove the right amount of moisture, check it again, and then it gets sent to the Speyside Coopers to be turned into turned into barrels. But these guys are a huge part of the, part of the Scottish Oak program and will be a really important partner uh, as we go forward. You'll see at this end down here that Greg's marked this one out for quarter cutting. So this is how we will, how the tree will go through the sawmill here. They cut it in quarters. So first of all, they're going to cut it this way, and then they turn it 90 degrees. They'll cut down here, turn it 90 degrees, cut down here. So you're constantly twisting and turning until the wood gets too small to take anything, uh, anything that's useful for a cask. But actually, the closer you get from the centre out to the, the, the outside of the tree, you're going to get much more tannin because the bark is there to protect the sugars in the wood, and that's where we get lots and lots of tannin from. The other thing we were talking about earlier is the age of the tree is going to affect flavor, uh, flavor quite dramatically. If we take a tree that's fully grown, that's a couple of hundred years old, out of, the, out of a forest, then of course it's going to be 
um, it's going to be very mature. But there's some trees, there's one down at the, the lake, it might have been removed actually, but it had fallen before it was 100 years old. So we can still use young oaks that haven't even become 100 years old. It just means that the flavour within the wood is going to be slightly different because there's going to be a different level of sugar, a different level of tannin, and all these things have a huge impact in flavour. So very much a learning uh, curve for us in terms of what we can do using the, the natural ingredients. You'll see here as well, things like this big knot, not going to be very useful for, for um, for our whiskey stave, so of course bits of bits of the wood will be sent to furniture makers. We can make some wonderful things out of some beautiful Scottish oak, but it's these nice, nice straight bits that we want.